On the 25th of July this year, we celebrate the centenary of the birth of Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind is probably best known for taking the X-ray photograph of DNA, enigmatically known as Photograph 51, at King's College London in May 1952. This led Francis Crick and James Watson to propose the double helical structure of DNA. It is less well known, however, that in addition to contributing to perhaps the greatest biological discovery of the 20th century, Rosalind also made internationally recognised advances in two other and very different fields. The first of these was the structure of coal, the other, very relevant to us today, the structure of viruses. In fact, Rosalind determined the first ever detailed structure of a virus. Rosalind was born in London and by the age of six was described by her aunt as alarmingly clever. She went to St Paul's Girls' School and excelled in almost every subject, but with one exception. For the school's director of music, none other than Gustav Holst, Rosalind apparently upset his optimistic belief that everyone had music in them. By the age of 16, Rosalind had, according to her mother, chosen science as her career, and she went on to study natural sciences at Newnham College, Cambridge. There, she certainly learned much about the theory of X-ray crystallography, as her college notebooks show. Cambridge's Cavendish Laboratory was, after all, a centre for the subject. And most intriguingly, following some notes on the chemical composition of proteins and nucleic acids, she wrote, Geometrical basis for inheritance. After her degree and a short research project in Cambridge, Rosalind joined the British Coal Utilisation Research Association. This was 1942, wartime, and understanding the microstructures of different coals was important. She made fascinating discoveries about the pores and cavities in coal and how they changed upon heating. She wrote five papers, three as sole author, and was awarded her PhD in 1945. Two years later, she moved to Paris, to the lab of Jacques Mering, to continue work on coals and other carbonised materials using X-ray diffraction. She discovered a distinction between those that turned to graphite upon extreme heating and others that did not, and her work gained her an international reputation and invitations to conferences. Some of her publications are still referenced today. Although Rosalind greatly enjoyed Paris, her work and colleagues and many mountain walking vacations, she felt that it was time to return to England and accepted an invitation to join the new Medical Research Council, MRC, Biophysics Research Unit, led by John Randall, Wheatstone Professor of Physics at King's College London. Randall's vision was to bring physicists, biologists and those of other disciplines together to solve important problems. I'm happy to say that his interdisciplinary spirit is alive and well today in the successor to that MRC unit, the Randall Centre for Cell and Molecular Biophysics, where I work, known locally always as the Randall. One of those important problems was DNA, and Rosalind's particular expertise in X-ray studies, not of perfectly ordered crystals but of partially disordered materials, was particularly well suited to the task. Randall was rather less effective in his handling of the relationship between Rosalind and Maurice Wilkins, deputy director of the unit. He had already taken X-ray diffraction photographs of bundles of DNA fibres, which excitingly pointed to a regular structure for the DNA molecule. In his letter to Rosalind, Randall wrote that she and PhD student Raymond Gosling would alone be working on DNA, but he failed to say anything at all to Morris, who was away at the time when Rosalind arrived in January 1951. Consequent misunderstanding between the two sadly prevented any effective collaboration. Rosalind, a naturally gifted and meticulous experimentalist, refined the X-ray setup and camera carefully controlling the pulling of the thin fibres of DNA molecules to ensure maximum alignment, and then controlling their water content and humidity. She discovered that DNA existed in two forms, which she called A and B. The latter, with higher water content, gave diffraction patterns different to those taken earlier by Maurice Wilkins. On Friday, May 2nd, 1952, Rosalind, with Ray Gosling, set up exposure number 51, that lasted 62 hours and finished on Tuesday, May the 6th. This was the best image yet of the B form and became known as Photograph 51. Described later by crystallographer J.D. Bernal as among the most beautiful X-ray photographs of any substance ever taken, 
it has since achieved iconic status. Its name, even taken as the title of a play by Anna Ziegler, which ran in London's West End in 2015 to Full Houses, starring Nicole Kidman as Rosalind Franklin. X-ray diffraction patterns of molecules are not like the shadows seen in medical X-ray images. Spots in diffraction patterns represent periodic structural features in the molecule. The X pattern in photograph 51 is strongly indicative of a helix. The X-rays strike the DNA perpendicular to the fibre axis. Seen from the side, a helix has a zigzag appearance, and the periodic zigs and zags give rise to the two intersecting rows of spots that form the X pattern. When, in early 1953, James Watson saw photograph 51, the clarity of this image prompted him, together with Francis Crick at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, to try to build a model, the famous double helix. Rosalind was against model building, or, as she saw it, guessing the answer, preferring instead to try to calculate the structure from the A-form patterns, which contained more data spots, a daunting task to carry out by hand with no computers. When Watson and Crick's double helical model of DNA was published in the journal Nature in April 1953, a paper from Wilkins and colleagues and another from Franklin and Gosling showing photograph 51 appeared alongside, apparently confirming the proposed structure. Rosalind was unaware that Watson and Crick, who failed to properly acknowledge the use of her data, had seen photograph 51. In fact, she herself was very close to the answer, as a draft manuscript dated the day before news of the double helix model reached King's shows. In this she describes a two-chain helix with one chain offset from the other by precisely the correct extent, three-eighths of the helical repeat, with the bases on the inside, phosphate groups on the outside, and ten units per turn. By the time the Nature papers were published, Rosalind had already moved to Birkbeck College at the invitation of Bernal, head of the crystallography department. There she had begun working on virus structure, again using X-ray diffraction. Viruses could be crystallised and the highly ordered arrays gave much more detailed X-ray diffraction patterns. Rosalind, working with Erin Klug and others, studied tobacco mosaic virus or TMV, the first virus ever to be identified back in the 1890s. Rosalind's X-ray analysis of TMV led to the first detailed structure for any virus, showing how the RNA molecule was encapsulated within a helical array of identical protein subunits. In anticipation of showcasing this major achievement at the World's Fair in Brussels 1958, a five-foot-high model was built. Sadly, by this time, Rosalind had already been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. She continued to work and at the very end of her life was trying to obtain X-ray images from crystals of human polio virus. She died on April the 16th, 1958, aged only 37, the day before the World's Fair opened and her TMV structure was unveiled. Rosalind achieved so much in such a short life and would undoubtedly have gone on to make many more discoveries in the field of virus structure. Her work was continued by Aaron Klug, who wrote of her, She worked beautifully. Her single-mindedness made her a first-class experimentalist with the sort of skill that blends intelligence and determination. And in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize awarded in 1982, he fully acknowledged her work and commented that Franklin herself might have stood on this platform had her life not been tragically cut short. Our plans to celebrate the centenary of Rosalind's birth with a symposium, an exhibition and more are currently paused. In 1940, at another time of national crisis, Rosalind wrote in a letter to her father, science and everyday life cannot and should not be separated. These words certainly resonate with us today as we celebrate the birthday and the life of a truly remarkable British scientist.